Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of the National Museum of American History, John Gray. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. And we're so appreciative that you've come tonight. And we welcome you to your National Museum of American History. And thank you so much for joining us. We honor and thank a legendary American journalist and author, Thomas J. Brokaw, 22-year anchor of the NBC Nightly News and now NBC's special correspondent. And we're pleased that so many distinguished guests are joining us tonight, including member, many members of the NBC family. We're honored that Tom's wife, Meredith, could join us. And Meredith is right down front. Welcome, Meredith. <laughs> and we also welcome our vice chair of the Smithsonian region, Steve Case and Jean Case are here. In a dramatic shift from just a few years ago, news, information, and indeed history are being disseminated through an ever-growing, varied, and fractured array of channels and media. Many of us find ourselves searching for clarity around the fundamental questions that underpin our nation. What does it mean to be American? And what is the story of America? As the National Museum, we are focused on bringing the nation together through a real understanding of our shared American history. We are exploring fundamental American ideals and ideas, like democracy, opportunity, and freedom, to, to create the most engaging, interesting, and inclusive American history that helps people make sense of the present and shape a more humane future. Earlier this summer, as part of a 15-year, 600 million reinvention of every facet of our work, we opened a new floor dedicated to the nation we build together, one level above us. Our two keystone exhibitions, American Democracy, A Great Leap of Faith, and Many Voices, One Nation, explore the power of our democracy and the history of citizen participation, debate, and compromise with a parallel story of the peopling of our nation. And beginning in 2018, we will open our third floor and complete our full transformation of the West Wing by exploring how democracy has shaped our distinctive American culture. Just inside the entrance to our new exhibition on American democracy is a humble but astonishing national treasure, the printing press on which Benjamin Franklin trained in London in the 1720s. From this press, Strang forth an unparalleled life encompassing so many remarkable roles, from publisher, journalist, author, to statesman, diplomat, and scientist. But Franklin understood the power of a free press and its essential role in fostering a robust and vibrant democracy. Every American takes inspiration from Franklin's example, and we acknowledge the special role those who have created, defended, and sustained a free press including our honoree tonight. As we express our sincere gratitude to our board member and chair of the Smithsonian Regents, David Rubenstein, we applaud and are deeply moved by his passion to make American history meaningful and engaging for all Americans. Through the National Museum of American History and its history organizations across our country, your giving has taken on many extraordinary forms. We're particularly appreciative of your intellectual contributions to the nation and your efforts to bring us all together. So who is a great American and why? Tonight, we will learn about American ideals and ideas from the conversation between David Rubenstein and Tom Brokaw. But first, let's learn more about this great American. From just a kid from South Dakota to one of America's most celebrated television journalists. Thomas J. Brokaw. Bringing the news to America for more than half a century, Tom Brokaw is a great American. 
Thomas John Brokaw was born February 6, 1940, in Webster, South Dakota. It was a momentous time in our nation's history, just as America began recovering from the Great Depression, and just before it became involved in World War II. Tom spent a happy childhood in South Dakota, excelling in school and in sports. But Tom always had his eyes on the horizon. He started his career in television journalism in 1960. Good evening, I'm Tom Brokaw. Working first in the Midwest, then later in the decade in Atlanta and in Los Angeles. Senator Robert Kennedy brought his presidential campaign to Southern California today. As his career progressed, he had his eyes on one assignment in particular, as a White House correspondent. In 1973, he got the job covering the White House for NBC. It is overcast and raining in Washington as President and Mrs. Nixon prepare to leave the White House for the last time as the first family. It was Tom's first opportunity to make an impression on a national stage, and more success followed. He went on to co-host the Today Show with Jane Polly, which brought him into millions of American homes every morning. I'm going to hit you 10 times before you count two. All right. I'm fast. Watch OK. It. When I say go, you say one, two. OK. Go. One, two. You want to see it again? <laughs> From the Today Show, Tom took the ultimate step. He was tapped for the top job in television journalism as anchor of a national nightly news broadcast. Tom would hold the dual role of anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly News for the next 22 years. Mark this day, May 2nd, 1994, as another major date on the calendar of freedom. Where his voice became a trusted staple in American homes. The Soviet Union, as we have known it for most of the 20th century, is breaking up now. He carved out a unique approach as news anchor. He could just as frequently be seen reporting from the studio as from a far-reaching corner of the globe, covering breaking news on the ground. Good evening, live from the Berlin Wall on the most historic night in this wall's history. Tom had gone on a hunch, and it paid off. He was the only American anchor to report from the fall of the Berlin Wall. But now, for the first time since the wall was erected in 1961, people will be able to move through freely. And he was the first American reporter to interview Mikhail Gorbachev. Are you prepared now to reduce the number of men, tanks, and attack helicopters that you have? Tom interviewed every U.S. president during his tenure, covered every presidential election, and spoke with the world's most important figures. The Chinese say that you're welcome to come back to Beijing, but only in a ceremonial religious post. I gather that that's not acceptable to you. Tom produced dozens of documentaries on issues as wide-ranging and important as race, global warming, and the war on terror. A gifted writer, he's penned numerous best-selling books. Most notably in his writing, he returned to the theme of what he knew best and first. Now, you guys haven't been back here in 40 years. Right. That's right, Tom. First time back. Yeah. The many lessons of those he famously calls the greatest generation. They were humbled by what they had done. And I thought, oh, my God, these are the people who raised me. And I thought, I've got to write about this. NBC News World Headquarters in New York. This is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. After 22 years of bringing Americans the news, Tom stepped down as anchor from NBC Nightly News on December 1st, 2004. It's in that spirit that I say thanks for all that I have learned from you. That's been my richest reward. That's Nightly News for this Wednesday night. I'm Tom Brokaw. During the course of more than 50 years in journalism, he's won numerous awards. After Mr. Brokaw has spoken, it'll be days later before you realize the significance of this great American and the message that he is bringing to you tonight. To commemorate a lifetime of achievements, Tom has donated to the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History a piece of the Berlin Wall, a memento of his historic scoop covering its fall, and the saber presented to him as the recipient of the Sylvanus Thayer Award. It is West Point's highest honor, awarded to U.S. citizens that exemplify the ideals of duty, honor, and country. Tom has become an elder statesman for the highest quality in American journalism. We need to find a way that we can converse with each other and try to understand each other. We come from many times different cultures, but we're common Americans and we have to find a way in the future. From just a kid from South Dakota to one of the most celebrated and venerated news journalists, Tom Brokaw is a great American. His story is a part of American history.
please welcome David Rubenstein and Tom Brokaw. For David, do it for David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a great honor. Tom, thank you very much for coming uh, David, tonight. Thank you. It's, it really is an honor for me to be here. This has always been one of my favorite institutions. And, you know, as a journalist and just as a curious kid, uh, over the years I've looked at American history and the artifacts of American history. Uh, one of the things I didn't give to the museum, because I have a hard time parting from it, is uh, when I was growing up in South Dakota on the Missouri River, I was a real outdoor river rat and in the hills. And one day, I was also a, what they called a rock puppy. They were, had real geologists, so I collected minerals and rocks and everything. I found an extraordinary piece of opalized wood, and it's called a chert. And it's what the Indians growing up in that part of the world, that's what they would treasure because they would make tomahawks out of it and, and uh, arrowheads and other things. So I have a collection of arrowheads, but I also have this chert, which I thought that was a tool that they must have been very thrilled when they found something like that because it would give them the capacity to go make the tools that are going to allow them to exist and also to, to be fighters. Well, those of us who grew up in metropolitan areas like Baltimore or New York, <laughs> we, we don't have South Dakota stories to tell. So um, I've always been envious of people who have South Dakota kind of stories to tell. But do you think you would have achieved your success if you had not grown up in South Dakota? I don't know. I do think it was very important. Uh, first of all, I grew up in a very working class family who uh, my parents both came through the Depression. My dad dropped out of school in the third grade. He had a, came from a large, uh, slightly dysfunctional family where everybody had to pull their own weight. And at the, uh, at the age of 10, he had to leave school to kind of go to work. And he was taken in by a Swedish homesteader who taught him how to drive a team of horses, deliver coal, drill a well. And then he later traded that skill for a passing construction crew saying they needed to rent his horses. And he said, I'll let you do that if you teach me how to operate that, which was a caterpillar. Ever a man and a machine were meant for each other was my father in big, heavy machinery. If it had a motor, he could run it. If it was broken, he could fix it. And my mother was the opposite. She came from a college-educated Irish family. They were struggling on the farm, and very attractive, very bright. And I'd often say, how do the two of you get together? And she'd say, well, your dad was the politest guy who showed up at our door. And he always had a little extra change to go do things when Prussian people did not. He had this wicked sense of humor, which he did. And uh, I, when I look back on that now, I think about how hard it was for my father to be growing up at a time when everybody in town thought he wouldn't amount to anything. And then on his, uh, about in one of his retirement years, when he was like in his mid-60s, he sat down on the 4th of July and recorded his life. We were astonished about how hard it had been for him. And, but he never complained. He never said it was unfair. He just had to work his way through things, and he was thrilled with where he ended up. Now, you grew up in South Dakota, went to Yankton High School, as I recall, and then you went to University of Iowa? Right. What happened to the University of South Dakota? Why'd you go to Iowa first? <laughs> Well, uh, it's a, a bit of a long story. I did, I was kind of a gregarious kid. I had a lot of ambition. And before I got to Yankton, I lived in a succession of small towns on the Missouri River where they were building dams. So Yankton was a big deal for me. I went from a high school with 40 kids to a high school with 400 kids. And I remember the first day that I was walking up the steps of this high school, and a, a man came running out of the school yelling, Ald is going to be a cheerleader. That was Meredith Ald to whom I've been married for 55 years. <laughs> and the reason they were so stunned that Meredith was a, Meredith was a, uh, a serious debater. She was a daughter of the doctor in town. And the idea that she was going to be a cheerleader uh, was quite astonishing to everybody. And then we quickly became friends. And, but I, I do remember that was my first day in school. Well, when you, you, you spent only one year at the University of Iowa, Right. and majored, as you've written, in uh, co-eds and beer, and then ultimately transferred back to the University of South Dakota. Right. 
But Meredith told you you had to get your act together at some point? She uh, more than told me to get my act together. <laughs> I, uh, I, I kind of came out of high school as a whiz kid, and the two of us had, you know, were the, the class officers and leads in the place. She was a cheerleader, I was a jock. She was in Girls Nation, I was governor of Boy State, so we had this trajectory. And people said, well, why didn't you date during those years? And I said, there's a simple answer to that. I didn't think she fooled around enough. And she, and she thought I fooled around too much. So that was the end of that. I mean, we were great pals, but there was no romance involved. But when she, she got in my face about how I had gone adrift seriously, and it was a really critical moment for me because I had such a regard for her, and I, I did this turnaround. And then she came in and said, maybe I went too far. I said, no, I really had it coming. And then we stunned all of our friends. Within a year, we got married. And uh, no one saw that coming, and we set off from Yankton, South Dakota, in the least expensive new car that her father could buy for us on Main Street. And everything we owned was in the back seat, and they were all wedding presents. Right. And that was the beginning of this adventurous life that we had. Right, so you have a great wife, but you have no job. Okay. Well, I have a great wife, but I did get a starter job, and it was in Omaha at a television station. I went down and effectively begged for this job, and the news director turned out to be a really important influence. He was a traditional, old-fashioned news guy, and he took me to lunch, and an hour later he said, I've never had anybody come to work for me who knows as much about politics as you do. We need somebody like that. And he said, I'll, I'll give you $90 a week to start. I said, I have to have 100 He said, you came begging for a job. You want a $10 raise before you start. <laughs> And I said, I am marrying the daughter of a doctor. I need a three-figure salary. So he'll think that I've got a future of some kind. And uh, he said, OK, you'll never get a raise. And he kept his word, by the way, for that. So you then worked for a few other uh, st local stations. But then you got an opportunity to work for NBC affiliate in California. Is that right? Well, no, what happened is that from Omaha, I got a big break. I was working the early morning shift, working Saturday nights. Meredith was teaching high school at Omaha Central High School. And by the way, the head of the English department, she was teaching English, the head of the English department was Warren Buffett's aunt. <laughs> and I've often said when we were in Omaha, we knew the Buffett who could diagram a sentence. We didn't know the one who could make you really rich. So we <laughs> missed on something. Anyhow, there I am. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of becoming familiar with NBC. They would come to Omaha a lot. I got a call one night from the biggest station in America in those days was WSB in Atlanta, Georgia. It was the middle of the civil rights movement. It was a very, very prominent and very accomplished station. And the guy said, we hear wonderful things about you. We have an opening on our 11 o'clock news. I'm a 25-year-old white boy from Omaha. And I'm thinking, this can't be true. And he said, we'd well, like you to fly down and take a look at this. And so I flew down out of a blizzard in Omaha arrived in an early spring night in Atlanta. The Magnolias are in bloom, a beautiful city. And they, uh, the headquarters of the station was in a fall antebellum mansion on Peachtree Street. And I thought, if I don't get this job, I'm going to kill myself. So I, <laughs> I did get the job. And I went to work as the 11 o'clock anchorman at 25 in Atlanta with all hell breaking loose. And a lot of times at 11.30 at night, I'd leave the station, go on and get on a charter plane, fly to Alabama fly to South Georgia, I go to the central part of Georgia where things were happening until NBC could get its people there. I was on NBC a lot, and on radio and on television both. And after we'd been there, I guess about six or seven months, NBC came and said, we want to hire you, and had to go to work for us. And so NBC hired me for the network at their affiliated station in Los Angeles, but it was, it was part of the network Okay, uh, so well. you did that for a few years, and then they asked you if you wanted to come and have the White House beat. Is that right? Well, what happened is they, they, I was, I'd gotten a reputation as a pretty, uh, uh, pretty considerable political reporter in California. I covered Ronald Reagan's first election. I was there the night that Bobby Kennedy got killed. I covered the Bobby Kennedy, Gene McCarthy race. California politics was like you know, a separate world. It was a big deal. And I was on the air a lot with that, but we had a great life in California. We just built a house on the beach with every dime that we had. And they kept saying, you gotta come east. John Chancellor used to say, you gotta come east and be a grown-up, Broco. And I'd say, I like being a grown-up in California, frankly, you know. <laughs> uh, and then they, Watergate broke out and said, now you've gotta come. So I had to go to Meredith Brokaw, who had a separate life out there of accomplishment and a lot of 
people who admired her independence and stuff. And so I said, we're going to move to Washington. And um, she arrived in Washington, D.C. in the middle of August. <laughs> we're leaving this beautiful beach house that we had just built in California to find a rental for us. And I thought, this is going to be the greatest test of our marriage imaginable. <laughs> The best thing that happened is that one of the houses that she looked at was owned by Art Buckwald and, and his uh, little house nearby. And she met Artie, and he later became a really close friend, and she was so cheered by his personality that she thought maybe there's a possibility that this will work out. So you're covering the White House under the Watergate era. When did you realize that Nixon couldn't survive, and when did you first realize he wasn't telling the truth? Oh, I... Um, I think uh, you know the evidence was building. Bob and, and uh, Carl were already pretty deep into the story at that point, and what was clear every day was that the stories were not adding up as they came out of the White House. I, I'd like to say this, not just because I was a member of the White House press corps, but I always thought that it was one of the most impressive and responsible uh, moments in American journalistic history, the way the White House press corps covered that story because we dealt with the facts as we found them every day. And I had a close friend. Everybody had kind of a, a running mate, so because you, you'd cover for each other. You know, do you think this story makes sense? My running mate was from the Wall Street Journal. Very serious little chess master. We were complete opposites. And a, and a print journalist, I was a broadcast journalist, and we would get out of there about once every five weeks to go to lunch uh, at the Ebbets Grill and have a hamburger, and I'd say, God, just doesn't make any sense what they've done in the last two days. And Fred would raise an eyebrow and say, until you remember that he's guilty. And I'd say, oh yeah, then it makes sense. <laughs> but we didn't say that on the air. You know, that was barroom talk that we would kind of come to that. Well, conclusion. he ultimately resigned, Ford became president, but then around 1976, you were asked to be the co-anchor of the Today Show to move to New York. So were you reluctant to move to New York or you were happy to get out of Washington? I love living in Washington. I still am very attached to it. I love coming back here. I have a lot of friends here. I love the, you know, the business of the city. I love the, the, the makeup of the city, and I'm, I'm always very comfortable here. It was not an easy call, but I had just been through Watergate, and it was going to be hard to, to top that as a story that I would be covering. And the other thing that I rarely talk about, they said, we want you to be the anchor of Nightly News at some point, but in the meantime, we need you to do the Today Show. To, so, to get to that chair, you got to go through this chair. And the Today Show in those days was by itself, frankly. It had no competition for all those years, so you could kind of do what you want to do. And it was much more serious than the morning shows are now. But as soon as I got there, ABC uh, kind of big, began to reinvent morning television with David Hartman, and they were very good at what they did. So uh, I was there for about two years, and we lost the lead uh, to David Hartman and ABC. And then the election came along in which Ronald Reagan was running for president. And we decided, the producer and I did, Steve Friedman, that I would be everywhere politics were. That I would go to every primary beyond morning, noon, and night. I would get on the plane and go to Egypt when Sadat was killed. I'd get on the plane when the shots were fired at the, um, at the pontiff in, in Vatican City. So we're going to make it a newsy program, but at the same time, it also have the entertainment part of it, but politics had really captured the attention of the country. And having covered Reagan, I knew that he would be a rock star on the scene. So do they pay you extra for traveling around so much, or they just pay you the same salary? <laughs> well, I got to tell you, the salaries were different in those days than they are now. <laughs> a lot different. But it was... You know, it was thrilling. We moved to New York. We decided we wanted to live in the city uh, for the obvious reasons of the arts and the schools and other things, and I could get to work quickly. So our girls were raised in New York. They went to very good schools, and Meredith started a toy store while we were there and, and was able to step out a little more in terms of do the things that she liked to do. We love the theater, so we went to a lot of openings, and the Today Show was always a part of that. So it was an exhilarating time to... Uh, to be in the news business, and uh, I was still doing that. And then I came to the end of five years at the Today Show, and I said, God, I don't want to be 
interviewing Cher the rest of my life, which is part of <laughs> what you have to do, although she was very entertaining to, to you know, For that job, don't you have to get up like at four in the morning and then you get tired of that? Yeah, but here's the best story about getting up at four o'clock in the morning. There are two parts to it. One is that you quickly learn that the most important thing you're gonna do is right away. And it's gonna be in front of, in those days, 35 million people. So you, know, you, you really had to be on your game when you got there. The other thing is people would always talk about the morning and how hard it is to get up, and I actually learned to kind of like it, because if you'd wind down, you do the most important thing, you wind down the rest of the day, and so nightly news, you had to be at the end, at the end of the day at, the, right. at your best form. And then I got a letter when I was leaving, I, when I was leaving the Today Show, because there'd been a lot of attention to that kind of stuff, from a woman in Pennsylvania. She stuck with me. She wrote, Mr. Brokaw, I remember the handwritten letter on line paper. I've read where you didn't like getting up early in the morning. Let me tell you about my, my job. I go to work at midnight, and I work in a commercial laundry, and I push big cartons, bin, bins of wet laundry from a hotel through the night to get it washed. And, hang. and the only really good part of my day is when I get off at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I go home and watch you and Jane Pauley on the Today Show. And then I have to get my kids off to school and do the other things. And so I tell that story to everybody who comes to the Today Show as a new head. Don't talk about getting up early in the morning. You're paid well, got a lot of help, and you're not working in a commercial laundry somewhere in Pennsylvania. Well, okay. Very instructive. Well, you got used to getting up early in the morning. You obviously liked it, but then they said it's time for the evening news show, and they paired you initially with somebody else. Well, the other thing, yeah, Roger Mudd and I started, it just didn't work. It was one of those things where you can't, Force chemistry. I have the highest regard for Roger. Still do. Was a great one of the best journalists of his generation. But, but the show just didn't work. And Dan was at CBS. Peter was just starting at ABC, and we were not doing well. So uh, the powers that be at NBC decided I was the younger guy. I'd been at NBC longer, and I didn't mind getting on a plane and going to where where the action was. And I knew most of the NBC affiliates, so they chose me. Understandably, it didn't make Roger very happy. Uh, and then we began to turn things around, but it was not easy. And my, my MO was to, if there's a story, it's always a mistake not to go. So I went everywhere that it was going on. Well, you were the, ultimately the anchor for 21 years, and among the places you went was, we saw in the video, Berlin. And what was it like to be there the night that the wall crumbled? Well, it was easily one of the most memorable nights of my career. Um, I didn't expect it to happen. People said, how did you know? I said, I didn't know. We knew that, um, Jerry, uh, I had a colleague who was a foreign editor, and uh, he came to me one day and said, you know, there's not much going on in, in America right now, but you know, it's getting very restless in Germany. They're pouring out of, uh, out of Berlin into Czechoslovakia, and there was a lot of pressure. They had overthrown uh, Egon Kuru, who was the the terrible, terrible guy had been running East Germany all those years, and they had a new poet bureau, and, and it was chaos. And he said, why don't you just go and do two days? So I went the first day, it was, I got into East Berlin for the first time, and it was kind of quiet chaos there. And the next day, I went back, and I said, I don't know whether we're gonna need the satellite tonight, but we ought to keep it. In those days, you had to make an order in advance. You just couldn't hit the button. So, um, Egon Krenz by then had been thrown, not quite in jail, but he was out of favor. And um, I'm going around East Berlin doing these stories, and late in the afternoon, uh, I was going to be at a news conference uh, where the head of the uh, Poet Bureau information, so-called, would be presiding. So we went, and everybody, and he was kind of droning on in a bureaucratic way, and Toward late in the news conference, somebody handed him a piece of paper and he said, oh, the other Politburo has decided that uh, lead, uh, the residents of the GDR can leave and return through any exit and the wall. We said, wait a minute, are you saying that they can go whether they have a visa or not? And he said, ah, I think that's what this means. And he got up and walked off the stage. <laughs> Everybody uh, in that room, there were a lot of East German journalists, for example, and our camera crew had been in Germany they'd been born in Germany, and they were all stunned by what they had just heard. I had an interview arranged with him, and I ran upstairs, and I remember my producer, a diminutive woman who had actually made the appointment for me, 
throwing her body against the door to keep other journalists out. Well, I did this interview with him. I said, read that again. So he read it again. And I said, this means that people can come and go. And he said, yeah, that's what it means. We have to do something to relieve the pressure. He was very cool about it. And I said, do you have any second thoughts about imprisoning these people? No. He said, I thought that the socialist system went on. So we grabbed the tape, ran downstairs, and I said to a group of my newspaper colleagues, it's over. The wall is coming down tonight uh, because it had been broadcast in East Germany. I got on the radio phone in those days in the car and said, wire everything tonight. We're going live from Berlin. We have a satellite at the Brandenburg Gate. And I went back and worked feverishly to get everything ready. Got to the gate about 25 minutes before we were supposed to go on the air. And the top of the wall was filled with West German students. The East German students were still terrified about coming across because the guards were there and the guards didn't know what was going on. So the guards would get out the water hoses and hose down the uh, Westerners who were up there and drive them off the wall with the exception of one man who stood there with his back to the, uh, to the water hoses and grinned and had his arms up triumphantly. And I said to Martin Fletcher, one of our colleagues, go get him. I can see him on the cover of Time magazine next week, the face of the new German citizen. And Martin came back and was doubled over and laughed. He said, not what we think. I said, what do you mean it's not what we think? He said, he's a drunk. He's been living over here in the forest. <laughs> and he said, this is the first shower he's had in about three right. weeks. So he's very happy to be up there getting hosed down. At that point. So, so normally, uh, anchors, evening news anchors, they love that job. It's a great job. But usually the only way they leave it is if they're pushed out. But you decided to leave voluntarily at a relatively young age. And why did you decide to leave uh, for 21 years uh, at the, as the NBC anchor? You could have stayed much longer if you wanted. I could have, uh, but I also felt strongly that new generations should come along and have their chance, as I did. I also felt that I couldn't leave that job during seasons that I care about. Uh, something called steelhead fishing in Canada. Uh, I'm a bird hunter. I love the falls in South Dakota and the Midwest, where I could go on and do that. And I wanted more flexibility. We had a whole run in our family when I would, I remember one night I, I was in Montana and I had just gotten there and I was very tired and Mary and I went out for a ride and came back, we're sitting in the house and our middle daughter called and said, Princess Diana has been in some kind of an auto accident. And a producer called and said, she's been in this terrible car crash. And I said, well, what do we think? He said, well, I think you gotta go. And I said, if she dies, well, he called me and he said, she's, she's gone. So I leaving a really remote ranch in Montana at about 10 o'clock at night to get to London ain't easy. And I knew a charter that could get me to Detroit where you could get, in those days, a Northwest flight all the way to London. I didn't have, I had a blazer and a pair of slacks and a couple of shirts out there, and that was about it. But on the way through the Detroit airport, I st stopped in one of those kind of cheap tie places called the tie rack, and I tried to find the best ties I could get. And I, I was wearing one on the day of the funeral. And one of the guests that we had on the air was Valentino, who had been in the service. <laughs> and I swear he stared at my tie the entire time. <laughs> and I was thinking, where did this guy get that tie? Was, uh, anyhow, that was one of those typical things. You, I flew through the night. I got to uh, Buckingham Palace at about 10 the next morning from Montana. and I had a full realization about how big this was going to be. There was a very working class guy there, tattoos, red face, streaming tears with his daughter, uh, who was about 10 and dressed like a little princess. And he said, she was our princess. She was our princess. And this is my princess. And we think this is family for us. And I thought, wow, that, this is going to be as big as it became. When you did leave NBC as the anchor, you stayed with NBC as a special correspondent, but you began writing some books, among other things. One of the books was The Greatest Generation. What inspired you to write that, and did you have any idea that it would become as famous as it did? Now, the last part of that, certainly I did not. What, what inspired it was that earlier I had gone to the 40th anniversary of D-Day. Now, you remember I grew up when the war was on, I was three years old, and I remember the war vividly. We lived on an army base. I wore a helmet, and I, you know, and everybody was going to war, coming home from war around us, and they were testing ordnance out on the South Dakota alkaline plains. So then I 
you know, then I grew up in the post-war period when there was prosperity for working class people. And you could think I was gonna be the first one for my family to go to college. And my dad bought his first new car. I'll never forget it. Uh, and everybody around us was like that. And we, and the, and the, we were all being raised in effect by veterans. The American Legion sponsored the baseball team, Boy Scout things, and they, they did everything. They never talked about their war experience. Never heard a peep about it. But everybody was a veteran. Um, and I went to Normandy for the 40th anniversary of D-Day. You saw some of them where I'm leading those two guys onto the beach. One of them was leading on me. He'd lost both legs during the war in the final two weeks. The other one had earned the Medal of Honor. And they described, to the right where they had landed, they described the ramp going down on their landing craft and their lieutenant and their first sergeant being shot through the head. And they're 18 years old, they have no leadership. And they get on the beach and they terrified down behind a tank trap. And a colonel comes loping down the beach and he later became a legendary figure and he had memorized a line based on his experience landing in Italy. He leaned over these guys and he said, there are two kinds of people on the beach, man the dead and those about to be dead. You gotta get off the beach. So they saw there was a bluff, they tried to get up the bluff, and on the bluff were uh, sappers who were detonating mines that had been planted there, and a lot of them had lost their legs already, and they were shooting themselves up with morphine, and they said, step here, step there, and then they got to the top, and these two men said to me, we realized that the rest of our lives we'd have to take it a day at a time, just try to survive. And I was so shaken by that, I went to lunch, and a uh, big raw bone guy came over to me and he said, Tom, Sam Gibbons, congressman from Florida. And I said, oh, congressman, I know who you are. What are you doing here? Well, I was here 40 years ago, he said. 82nd Airborne. I said, you want to talk about it? And he said, never have, but yeah, I'll tell you what happened. And he started to tell the story of jumping in behind enemy lines. His team is scattered. His wife comes over because he began to cry. And she said, I've never heard these stories. And uh, he said, I've got to tell the story all the way through. Well, he had a terrible time. He put together a little crew and uh, they fought back and forth up and down the road. They thought the invasion had failed and that they were gonna be just shooting, tar it'd be target practice for the Germans. And they kept fighting from village to village to village until they saw the hookup. And I'll share with you something as a talisman of that experience for me that I uh, I've kept in my pocket. He said, I said, how did you hook up with people? And he said, it was this. Everybody had been given a cricket in the 82nd Airborne because they didn't know how they were going to communicate with each other. So he said, when I landed and stuffed my parachute away, I had none of my team around me. I didn't know where they were. So he said, I click once and hope I hear that, which means I hear you and I'm coming. And he said, I clicked, heard the double click, guy came, clicked again, got another guy, and that's how they put together their teams. For me, the metaphor of this is now in our lives in this country is that we all should either symbolically or realistically have one of these. And when we are so divided in so many ways, I would like this to be a new symbol of how we can get back together. Because when they responded, they didn't say, are you a member of the Tea Party? Because I can't work with you if you're a member of the Tea Party. Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? I can't work with you. They just said, I'm coming. We're going to win this damn war. And they did against great odds. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through our lives, Democrats and Republicans and other people as well, about, and I really think that kind of could become a symbol of the time. So when you, when you were writing that book, when, when did the title, The Greatest Generation, come to you? Was that the title that you always knew you were gonna use? No, I was on the Today Show with Katie Couric at the 50th anniversary. Um, and she said, I, you know, you try to think about what you're gonna say the next day. And I thought to myself, and I, by then I'd been speaking about uh, these men and women and that time, uh, lectures and, uh, and uh, commencement addresses and so on. 
and uh, with Katie, uh, she said, so what do you think? Of the, I said, I think it's the greatest generation any society ever produced. Survived the Depression, not prepared for to go to war. I mean, there was big political resistance to it. Roosevelt was a genius about how he got us ready for it. And then, just as they were coming out of the Depression, they were asked to go fight the greatest military machine that had ever been assembled and save the world, and they did that. So Katie, I said, I think that's the greatest generation any society has ever produced because they were, African Americans were not treated well, but they fought very hard and heroically, and other people, but everybody had a role in it. And at home, uh, you know, David McCall and I were just together with you down at the World War II Museum, and David talked about it. In Pittsburgh, I went out and got scrap iron and did all that stuff. And I lived in an army basis, so everybody was conscious of, uh, you know, we didn't have Christmas presents, for example, for the children. My dad's crew made them for us so that we could have handmade things. And you, you know, and women would draw lines on the back of their legs to look like they were wearing stockings and that kind of thing that was going on. So it was a total immersion in it. Uh, and then when the time came when they could have a real life, they set out on building modern America and they wanted to put the war behind them. Very quickly, I just tell you one of my very favorite stories that I stumbled onto when I was there. There were three men who were uh, wounded in different parts of the war, one in Italy, uh, well, actually two in Italy, and then one on D-Day. And they were shipped back to America, and they went to Battle Creek, Michigan, and they were put into a, uh, a kind of a larger room for their wounds, and they were companions there, and they talked every day about what they wanted to do with their lives after they left there, after they got repaired physically. And one of them was Danny Inouye, the other one was Bob Dole, and the other one was uh, the man for whom the Senate office building is named. Uh, and so it was uh, an astonishing experience because they decided as they left there that they really wanted to be public servants for the rest of their lives. So you wrote a number of books relating to the greatest generation, but a more recent book was uh, a book called A Lucky Life, Interrupted, and that was about your struggle with multiple myeloma. When did you first realize that you had this disease? Well, I, uh, it was four years ago, um, about now, that I was diagnosed. And I had been a very active summer. I bicycled across uh, South America. Uh, Meredith and I had gone to Africa uh, because Nelson Mandela was dying, and then we visited a friend. We were out in the bush doing a lot of stuff. I was fishing in Montana on the Missouri River. And I had this persistent backache, and um, the people I used for orthopedics would say, God, Tom, it's your lifestyle. You know, you're always out there pushing the envelope. I don't see anything that should give us any alarm. But on the Missouri River one day, I was fishing, and I was in the front of the boat, and I inexplicably fell. I was just not like me to do that. And I, and I had to have an ice pack all day. So I went back to the Mayo Clinic, and uh, my very, very smart internist there read all this orthopedic stuff, he said, it shouldn't last this long. It shouldn't last this long. So on his own, this is an extraordinarily accomplished position. He is a internist. He got blood, and he, then he did evidentiary medicine. He started eliminating the possibilities, and at the end of three hours, on his own, he said to the head of internal medicine, who was an oncologist, I think Tom Brokaw has multiple myeloma. So they called me in and said, we want to share something with you. And they were going to start reading stuff off the charts. I thought they were going to say you got a parasite, because I used to pick them up when I'd be in the Middle Eastern Africa, uh, blood invasion. And the oncologist, who I have later teased, must have been out of school when bedside manners were taught, because <laughs> he turned to me and he said, opening line, uh, you have a malignancy. It's called multiple myeloma. You know people who've died from this. Geraldine Ferraro died from it. She lived with it for 12 years, and she did die from it. Frank Reynolds, the ABC anchorman, you must have known. I said, he, that's what he died from. I had no <laughs> idea. I actually had, I actually went into this kind of uh, bifurcated mindset. My journalistic instincts kicked in at that point. And I said, is there a cure? And they said, no, there's no cure, but we can maintain you, and we think that we can give you a, a good life. How long do I have? Well, the statistics now say five years, but you should do better than that because of your health and the advances that we're making. On the other half of my mind, I'm saying, 
Just say that I had cancer. I have a terminal case of cancer. I just can't find that hard to fathom. So we went through that back and forth. I could see my internist behind the kind of cold-blooded uh, oncologist, and he was looking quite concerned. I was on a crash course to get a documentary done on the 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I was writing it. And I was back in my room, and I and went back to the room kind of in a daze, and I thought, God, I've got to get this thing done. And I had my iPad open to multiple myeloma. What is it and how you treat it? I was working on this other thing. And uh, I was on the board of the Mayo Clinic at the time. And we had, Thursday nights, we had very important dinners in which donors come and do things, and I didn't show up for it. And one of my very, very close friends was on the board as well, and he called me. He said, you're not here. What's up? And I said, let's come over and have a drink. <laughs> so we went down to the bar, and I said, I've got a cancer, Ron, and I, I don't know what this means, but it's obviously going to change my life. Uh, you know, I always remember we had one and a half martinis apiece. We shared the last one. And uh, I had to do a bunch of tests the next day and flew to Montana. I didn't want to tell Meredith on the phone. I wanted to tell her in person. I got there late, late at night. And we live in a really remote area on a winding gravel road. And we did that. And I had a conversation going about the dogs and the ranch and everything. We got to the ranch. I fixed a stiff drink and went up to the bedroom and sat on the side of the bed and said to her, our lives have changed. I've got cancer. And Meredith is a real warrior, really stoic, and she just walked down and said, well, what does this mean? And I told her, I don't, I'm not sure what it means, but it's, uh, it's not treatable. Uh, it is treatable, but it's not curable. And so we went to bed in each other's arms. The next morning, I got up foolishly. Uh, felt pretty good, so I thought, I'm going fishing. Not a smart thing to do. I, I drove about four hours with an ice pack on my back, and three days later they had to medevac me back to the Mayo Clinic because there was so much uh, bone damage. I had a hole in my pelvis. I didn't realize I had four fractures in my spine. Um, but I've been very, very lucky. And I must tell you, it is in some ways one of the defining experiences of my life. I think in so many ways I'm a better person because I am now fully aware of what other families are going through all the time. And they don't have the resources that we have in our family, and it's very, very expensive. And then I became very curious about the treatment of cancer and how you're dealing with it. And I've become, because of the high profile that I've had, I've become kind of a, I don't know quite how to describe it, I'm someone that people call just out of the say, look, I've got multiple lime or something, and I say, where are you, and the, this is the doctor you ought to see it was the best facility for it. And it made me very conscious of the fragility of life and very, very conscious of the importance of family, about how you relate to each other. And, and Meredith was a rock during it all. And she's the daughter of a doctor who should have been a doctor. And we have this daughter who is a doctor. And she came back. And then the other daughters as well weighed in on stuff and, uh, and kept things going. So I really, in many ways, it's an extension of the broke off streak of luck. I've got a cancer that we've got it under control. I'm not sure how long that's gonna go on, but in the meantime, they're making great gains in this cancer. And we could afford the care, whatever we needed. That was a huge, huge asset for us as well. And it really did raise my consciousness about healthcare in America. And I, I, don't, I no longer wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, you've got cancer. I did for a while. I'd get up you know, to go shave or come out of the shower, and I'd think, my God, you've got cancer. Because it was the first profound defeat that I'd had as a human being. Everything had gone. You know, I was on a fast track in my business. I had a great marriage. We had wonderful experiences. And then suddenly, uh, there is this kind of shot from the side that proves to you, as we all are, you're vulnerable. And uh, there are no guarantees in life. And you develop a whole new consciousness about the preciousness of life and try to share that with people as well. So that's where I am, and I, I expect to have a long, good life and live with this as long as I need to. I have a friend who was my pilot fish, this is the last story I'll tell you, who had gotten a cancer a year before I did. 
I didn't know this until I wrote an article before I got diagnosed, and then I came back and I said, Frank, what do I need to know? So we've been going through it together. Then his began to fall apart, and he's in Philadelphia in a new experimental program developed by the Chinese, of all things, called CAR-T immunotherapy, in which they developed a way to unleash the genes that can kill the cancer. And it's very toxic, and it's not easy. But I had a note from him today saying, the doctors think with a reduction of my tumors, I may be eliminating multiple myeloma. It would be a huge triumph. So I'm a, I cannot tell you how, what a fan I am of the work that's going on in cancer research and laboratories in the middle of the night. And by the way, in this conversation we have about immigrants, a lot of them are immigrants. You know, they're coming here from East India, they're coming here from Italy and Spain, and they're coming from South America working in these labs. So I'm a lucky guy. Well, um, the book I, is one I highly recommend. It's extremely well written and very emotional, as your story uh, just now was. Uh, in the remaining time, I'd like to ask you two questions. One, what, as you look back on your life, what are you most proud of, and what do you see as the greatest legacy that you ultimately will have people think about you? No, I think I'm most proud of the fact that of our family. And, uh, you know, I, I got very lucky in uh, meeting Meredith when I did, and we've had this wonderful life together. We're yin and yang. She's an expert bridge player. She's very meticulous in everything she does. I'm kind of a journalist out there, you know, <laughs> freewheeling uh, and stuff. And she's very cool and calm about whatever there was. One of our favorite stories, I'm, I, I will embarrass Meredith probably, but there was a time when I, when I couldn't relieve myself. I was in bed. I was paralyzed with pain. So in the middle of the night, I have to call on her to help me. And she would get up, no complaints about it all, and you get these kind of funny bottles thing, and we, everything was slow motion, so I ended up calling it Tai Chi P, because <laughs> thing had to be done very slowly. <laughs> and no one laughed harder than Merit did. And then, and then on my career, uh, what I'm most proud of is that I got it mostly right. And when I didn't get it right, I was quick to acknowledge that we didn't have it right, we need to work harder at it. I've never, if ever one person was meant to have one profession, it was me in journalism. I just love the crap that I'm involved in. And of the things you would like to do over the remaining 10, 20, 30 years of your life, what are the, your objectives you have? Well, um, I, I keep developing these goals, and then I keep setting them aside because I really revert to the things I really like best to do. I'm, I'm not happy with my handwriting. So I have ordered, I'm ordered a calligraphy set to try to get better <laughs> with my handwriting. But it, it's been on open merits for how long? For three months or something like that? <laughs> I haven't opened it up yet. Uh, I'm trying to get better at the things that I like to do, like fly fishing and, um, and, and, and that kind of thing. And I like, I love writing, uh, frankly. I, I didn't have the confidence when I first started writing. The first piece I ever wrote uh, for print a longer piece was for the LA Times on a terrible river running accident that I was involved in. Two people were killed, and I wrote that story. And they prominently displayed it in their magazine. And then I got more confident about my writing. And I, I really enjoy the process of it. I'm writing more for the Times. I got another op ed page that's in the, right now on the assembly line that I'll write for them. Um, and I still love television, I still love the craft of selling something visual that takes you to a place that you wouldn't get to otherwise. Why fishing has been an important part of your life. So explain in the final question. Your brain is this big. The fish's brain is this big. Why is it so hard to outsmart a fish when their brain is this, <laughs> yours is that big? Why is that so challenging? <laughs> well, I'm gonna, tell you, I'm gonna tell you a story about brains at the moment, which I've not talked about much, is that uh, I've also gotten very curious about all this stuff because I woke up in Montana uh, three weeks ago, and I looked out the window, and it was a kaleidoscope. Nothing fit together. I stepped out of bed, and I stumbled across the room with this terrible case of vertigo. And I went downstairs, and our daughter, uh, the physician, said, my god, it could be a heart, it could be a stroke, we've got to figure this out. We rushed to town. The new uh, uh, facility there has very good CAT scans and everything, and they said, that's none of that. So I called my friends at the Mayo Clinic, and the, and the head of the Mayo Clinic is a neurologist. He said, we're sending a plane. You're going to be medevaced to the clinic. 
I'm sure very few in this room have ever heard of a condition called vestibular neuritis. The inner ear is compromised for reasons they don't know. And it throws everything off balance because the inner ear sends the signals to the brain about balance. And so I, was, I couldn't walk. I had to have a walker, I had to have a cane. And in four days uh, at the Mayo Clinic, these genius therapists and, and the others got me stable so I could walk without wow. that. And they said, you're lucky because sometimes it goes on for two months. I'm not, I've got one more therapy session yet, but it was really weird. And so that gets me thinking about the brain, you know, and how it works and what we do. Well, you've come up with a improvement on Obamacare. Be on the board of the Mayo Clinic <laughs> and you can solve any problem, right? Well, I gotta tell you that I, uh, uh, I'll give you a little peek at something. I, look, healthcare is 20% of our economy, we know that. It is complex, it affects every family in America. I don't think that this latest plan is gonna fly. Uh, it, it may get somewhere down the road, but it is much more complex than that. I think that President Obama made a mistake by trying to do too much all at once at the beginning, and you couldn't repair it on the run, right. frankly. It would have been better to take the 20% of the country or the, the, didn't have coverage, and just let's begin with them, and then ease our way into it. But now you're all involved in the ideology of it, and, um, and the other thing that's going on, the healthcare in America, outside of Washington, is a big consolidation. There are big hospital systems now in remote places like Nebraska and South Dakota and so on. The small hospitals have gone away because they're just not economically feasible to run. So it is very complex for those big places to run on a, and I know this from my Mayo experience, to run on a physically uh, responsible basis. And uh, if you make a state decide whether they want to do Medicaid or not, that's going to have an enormous social impact on this country. People are not, well, I'm not going to move to Iowa. They don't have Medicaid. They're, they've decided in that state not to do it. They'll have shifts of all kinds. And the fact is that this is a perfect example of where we've got to get together. And I think a lot of the blame, the Republicans promised for seven years that they were gonna get rid of Obamacare. And I do think it needed a lot of improvement. But in seven years, they mostly just voted that we're gonna throw it out. And then when the time came, they didn't have a plan. And so and it now it's also in the white hot environment of trying to do this with everybody looking in and all the stakeholders are looking in as well. Um, I can't think of a more important, frankly, domestic uh, issue for us than getting this right. And maybe the way, only way we can get it right is say, okay, we're gonna do the best we can for the next year on the system that's in place. We've got to put together uh, really a bipartisan group to try to work this out. Tom, I'm glad to hear your health is in good shape, and I'm glad to hear that uh, you're feeling well, and I wanna thank you on behalf of all Americans for your service to our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Tom, thank you very much. And also, thank you for your donation to the nation's collection with the West Point presentation Sabre, which we received from the United States Military Academy for embodying its motto, duty, honor, and country. And for two pieces of the Berlin Wall from November 9th, 1989, commemorating your historic live reporting from that remarkable moment in history and several other important objects will be joining our collection of national treasures to be preserved and shared with the American people and the world in perpetuity. So Tom, would you please sign your life away with this document, which in essence is a deed of gift for what you've given to the national collection. I really wish that I could uh, be signing something in which I am the very generous benefactor of giving to you the first computer, which I invented. Which <laughs> I invented. That's not gonna happen. Well, when you find it, we will take it. Okay.
And it is now my privilege, on behalf of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, to present the Great American's Medal to Thomas J. Brokaw for his commitment for his commitment to journalism and steadfast defense of freedom of the press and a life of public service in the furthering of American democracy, for recording the accomplishments of the greatest generation, for bringing a voice of assurance and trust as the American people face the impact of September 11th, 2001, for his uncompromising principles based on American ideals and ideas through these values and achievements, he defines service at the highest level and the true meaning of a great American. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And additionally, and this is very special for you, just you, Tom, we're honored to present you with the special gift from two pioneering Americans to another, a reproduction of Meriwether Lewis and Williams Clark's silver-plated expedition pocket compass. It's on view in our exhibition, The American Presidency, and we have brought it out here today for you to see. Lewis and Clark used this compass to help guide their journey across a new country. The compass was one of the few instruments to survive their harrowing trek. May it continue to help you guide the American people towards greater knowledge and freedom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, no, no slides. And what's, what's so interesting about here? Oh, wow, look at that. I, I just would make one quick observation about uh, Lewis and Clark. I actually grew up on the Missouri River. Uh, Meredith and I lived on the Missouri. I did until we left Omaha. And so it was an important artery in my childhood. And then when I was seven years old, um, with my parents, we moved to a remote part of South Dakota. And that's not an oxymoron, by the way. This was really remote. <laughs> Uh, where uh, there had been a, a, a cavalry fort across the river where Sitting Bull had been saved. But Lewis and Clark came up that stretch and they talk about it uh, in their uh, diaries that they kept in Stephen Ambrose's book. And I can't tell you how many times as a, from my seventh year to my 15th year that I would go down and walk along there and try to imagine what it was like because they were pushing against the current, which could be very strong. The other thing that was going on in the Great Plains in those days, which is hard to imagine now, Great Plains were covered with bison, and they were covered with elk, and they were covered with grizzly bears out there. So this is an extraordinary American savanna that existed, and how they accomplished not just that part of the trip, but then they get into Montana, and they go through the mountains, and they get to Lobo Pass thinking they're gonna see the Pacific Ocean. <coughs> And that's on the western end of Montana. They got to get it all the way across now to the Pacific Ocean, the Grove on, and then come back. On the way back, Lewis says to Clark, do you remember that river that we crossed as we were getting up now as the Montana-North Dakota border? I want you to go find that. And then I want you to float, and we'll reconnect. Imagine this, in the middle of the wilderness. We'll reconnect at the Missouri and what is now another river called the Yellowstone River. So Sacagawea knew where that river was. And she led the smaller band across the mountains down to where we now spend a lot of our lives, onto the Yellowstone River. And they began this kind of northeastern uh, expedition. And they had their horses stolen by a Crow tribe. So they built bull boats out of willows and they floated on the Yellowstone River. And they had to wait one whole day while a bison herd was so great that it took a whole day for it to go across the river. And they finally get to the confluence of the Yellowstone and the Missouri River. And in a bush nearby was a piece of leather parchment. And it was a note 
from Lewis to Clark saying, we left here, I don't remember the dates now, it was July. It was like three days earlier. Come fast, I need your help. And so Lewis uh, Clark pushed his team down and they caught up to him. And his friend Lewis had been uh, wounded in a hunting accident in his buttocks. And he was in terrible shape and Clark cleaned it up and got him kind of repaired and then they went on to St. Louis, and when they arrived in St. Louis, people were astonished. Everybody had given up for dead. And Lewis said, where's the mail boat? We need to send a note to the president, President Jefferson. And they said, it left a day or so. He sent his best man after the mail boat, turned it around, came back to St. Louis. And he sent a message to President Jefferson saying, We've accomplished our mission. We've seen the Pacific Ocean. We've learned so much about North America. And for the first time, he signed it, Lewis and Clark. Because Clark had been told by the military, or Lewis had been told by the military, that Clark could not have equal rank. But Lewis always treated him as an absolute equal. I find that one of the most riveting stories about it. And quite honestly, what I've done here is replicate the way that it was always told by candlelight around our dinner table in Montana by Stephen Ambrose. And he could hold the whole audience in his hands. So that's something to